Um, so just a brief outline of what we're going to uh, going to share with you today. Um, Open an address shortly from David Thursden. Um, I'll give a very brief overview uh, updates of uh, where we're at with the Southwest Food Hub. I'm then going to introduce you to uh, Cindy and Alan, who will give you uh, a beginner's guide to the social value portal uh, and social value uh, and its involvement with public sector procurement. Then delighted that Bethan uh, Williams is joining us from the NFU to talk about some of the great work that they're doing um, to help producers and suppliers access um, more public sector opportunities. And then Lee Davis joins us from Partners and one of our sponsors, but also what we try to do within these events is give food and drink producers and buyers as well, um, some useful insights into parts of their business um, that may be useful. So Lee's um, gonna give us some insight into how Partners and may be able to help. Um, and I'll, tr I'll try and wrap us all up before one o'clock um, and, um, and then we can all go off to the pub for lunch, um, hopefully outside. At, the, at social distance level. So, um, but just before we get going, uh, we always like to know who's joining us. So uh, we're just gonna run a quick poll on who are you? So if you can just very quickly and spontaneously answer who you are, which of which are those headings, are you a food producer, farmer, caterer, wholesaler, public sector buyer, logistics provider, policy maker, or an interested or interesting other? So if you can just tick one of those, those uh, answers for us, that'll be great. Just leave that for a few seconds. Okay, Alan, are we almost there with that? Okay, thank you very much for your answers there. Um, so we've got some uh, introductions going on in the chat. I'm going to try and reduce my screen so that I can see that and also not close the whole event, that would be a disaster. So to uh, our opening address and delighted to welcome David Thurston. Um, David uh, is a real leader in the agri-food movement, uh, not just in the region, but nationally. Um, he wears more hats than I do, which is, uh, is, is something. Um, and amongst the, uh, the, the things that he does, he's the National Trust trustee, he's the chair of Dyson Farming, and he's a commissioner for the Food and Farming and Countryside Commission, which David is gonna talk to you a little bit more about today. And also, He's got a, quite a significant Wikipedia page, and he's a first-class cricketer, David, apparently, um, an all-rounder with best bowling averages of six for 60. So, David, please come to the crease. Uh, thank you, Greg. That's the most original introduction I've had, and I don't know who put up that Wikipedia page, I have to say, but I've, I came across it the other day. Very weird. Anyway, um, so... Um, I am delighted to be here with you uh, today, and I'm here really partly as one of the advisory board uh, working with the team at the Southwest Food Hub. Um, and the advisory board sit with the team here just discussing how things are going forward and, and how, we should, uh, how we should carry on. Um, and as Greg said, I've got various roles uh, within the uh, farming and food uh, sector. And I have experience of, of producing food for the market in various different ways. And if I go back several years from um, selling uh, spuds grown in a two acre field, sitting on the back of a tractor, lifting the spuds and that terrible time when your finger goes right into the spud because the spud is not as good as it should be and you don't put it into your sack that you're taking off to sell. But you know, very basic stuff originally. Um, and now um, through my chairmanship of uh, Dyson Farming, uh, selling strawberries from a 15 acre glass house uh, through M&S, which, which we launched just the other day. So, um, you know, I have, I have some experience and not as much as some of you, I'm quite sure, and, uh, but, but I'm learning. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, Greg mentioned was uh, that I am a commissioner of the Food Farming and Countryside Commission, and that was an independent um, commission that was uh, set up in November 2017, and it's funded by um, the charity, the Esme Fairburn Foundation, which you may have come across before. And we produced our first report, which we called Our Future in the Land, following, us, um, following a, a lot of research and discussion with people around the country, including a bicycle tour uh, around um, the mo most or all of the UK. And, and, and that was all embedded in that report that we produced and included in our recommendations was a recommendation to mobilize the power of public procurement. 
Um, so um, what do we mean by that? I think we meant that we wanted to start to use the power of procurement to try and shift the food system. One of the things we're trying to do is to help a transition to a more uh, environmentally and socially friendly way of farming. Um, and uh, we felt that the power of procurement could be used to try and help shift that food system by gradually raising standards and providing this sort of stable contracts for growers and producers that enable them to develop their markets and farm accordingly. So we talked about uh, public bodies sourcing 40% of their food from local sources by 2021 and aiming for 80% within seven years and using the power of, of the public sector, 2.4 billion pounds a year on catering uh, to try and achieve some of our aims. And we drew attention to the Social Value Act uh, 2012, um, which uh, requires public bodies to consider how the services that they source can improve the economic, social, and environmental well being of the area. Um, and despite that act having been around since 2012, we noted that the impact of it was so far limited and it was often more ignored than followed in reality. But we felt that it was an important bit of legislation uh, which could be used to um, fulfill some of the aims that we wanted. Um, so our commission works um, largely in partnership with uh, other people. We we don't. There's absolutely no point in reinventing the wheel if other people are doing good things. So we try and support where good stuff is already happening, uh, and if there are gaps or where there may be gaps, we consider whether we should step in ourselves with you know somewhat limited resources from our charitable funders. And uh, part of our work has been to look at what's happening practically uh, around uh, the UK. Uh, we do try and work UK wide. And we have um, a, a particular um, local uh, inquiry going on in each of the three devolved nations and in two counties, Cumbria and Devon. And I chair the, uh, the Devon inquiry as well as being a commissioner for commission nationally. And we're looking at various projects in Devon. We're working with young people in South Devon College on their relationship with food and agriculture um, and trying to see whether and how they might be interested in food and agriculture, both in terms of careers or as, as consumers or as citizens themselves. And uh, that work's been slightly held up by COVID, but, but continues. We've also been looking at the transition um, that is uh, necessary to, to ensure that we deal with um, uh, the sort of planetary issues of, of climate change and everything else. And we're looking at how we deal in what is really uh, down in Devon anyway, a, a, a grass-based set of agricultural systems and to see how that might uh, alter, uh, looking at things like carbon sequestration and so on. And um, we're also looking at land use and whether we should have a land use framework which actually manages to uh, arbitrate, if you like, or sort out the competing uses that people want to put land to today. Um, and um, we are going to uh, get some extra funding for a study on land use. Uh, but of course, there's already great work going on in some other areas where we don't need to be doing extra work. And the Southwest Food Hub is a classic example of that. And it picks up that recommendation that I mentioned in our, uh, in our uh, first report. And uh, it's trying to make uh, progress in an area uh, even more in the spotlight since COVID about uh, local sourcing. Uh, but of course, suffering in the same way as others are from the impacts of COVID on trying to get businesses going uh, forward as they should be. So it's really good um, that we're here today. Great that we're talking about social value and I hope you really enjoyed and I look forward to hearing what people have to say.
So great, that's me done. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. And yeah, it's uh, it's great to be in partnership with Food Farming Countryside Commission, and uh, we're very grateful to have you amongst our advisory board as well. But thanks for your time today, especially as uh, I know you've got some busier things to crack on with. So. Uh, Thanks again. Um, and uh, just um, in light of time, I've been given an instruction by Ellen uh, that I need to whiz through my bit. So I'm now going to move on and uh, and share with you just a very short update um, on the Southwest Food Hub. So um, let's go here. So we haven't got time to uh, to dwell on opening slides. So just if, if uh, I'm assuming that uh, most people have joined us before and obviously we share all of the presentations along with the, the event online so you can tap into this afterwards but sort of central to um, the uh, evolution of the future food framework which is what Southwest Food Hub is focused on helping to deliver are the timelines um, around the crime commercial services setting up of the framework um, and obviously um, we know that due to redeployment of resources and, and other reasons um, that there have been delays, but these timelines now are firm um, and they are uh, progress, if your progress is being made towards these. Um, we know uh, from the CCS team, Crown Commercial Services team, that um, some of the resources that had to be redeployed to track and trace and testings and vaccinations um, are now returning to the team. There's new resources being put into the team. And at the next event, we hope to share with you sort of a, a, a recharged approach uh, from, from CCS and the relationship with the Southwest Food Hub. But these timings, as I say, are central to um, our ability to de start delivering on the Future Food Framework early, early next year. Um, just as well in terms of other activities, um, we're working very closely with the NFU, um, working both in terms of on a, on a local level with Alex Stevens and the team to make sure we're communicating um, all the opportunities to producers and to processes um, that, that exist within the future food framework. Um, we're also then working on a more national level, influencing government and others. We're working with Bethan uh, to make sure that we're part of the, the necessary strategies. Bethan will come on to talk about more of that a bit later today. Uh, a bit, a bit later in this event um, and also um, very excited to be working with the NFU as well on some research that will help us to more uncover um, the supply versus demand balance in the southwest region so that's a uh, work again that we hope to update you on in future events. Some of you uh, may have seen the country file um, episode last Sunday um, Tom Heap uh, focused in on public sector procurement, started with some of the sort of grim realities that perhaps exist now, uh, and then progressed towards some of the light at the end of the tunnel and some of the things that can happen. And uh, those of you who watched hopefully would have noticed that the Southwest Food Hub were mentioned quite a bit during that part. Um, and that sort of uh, symbolizes um, some of the momentum that's going on and a lot of the will um, that is out there to try and open up public sector procurement and help it to help the agri-food sector to recover. So uh, we're really pleased and proud to be part of that um, and uh, may it be the first of many um, such really high level communications. Um, and then just in terms of our sort of political partnerships, um, like many others, we were asked to participate in the, uh, the inquiry into public sector procurement conducted by EFRA, which started late last year. We gave evidence um, and the report was due to be out this week, in fact, um, but because of circumstances around the royal family that we're all aware of, um, that that's been delayed until the end of next week. So the report will be circulated next week and that will make for really interesting reading and a catalyst for activity as well. Again, we'll touch on in, in, uh, in more detail in future events, perhaps in the next event, but just wanted to sort of, um, I suppose, share with, with this audience um, that, uh, that the role really of, of Southwest Food Hub um, and how we work with um, you know the the important departments uh, within government that are making things happen. So Crown Commercial Services that we touched on will be the the team that pull together and build the framework and then effectively um, manage the transactions between the public sector procurement and suppliers. So very key and central to making everything happen. So we work very closely with them. Defra, um, who you you would have witnessed at the last event, um, presented at the last event, uh, very key because they set the standards of food um, that need to be bought for public sector um, to use um, and then as you know or will know from the last event there's a review of those standards the government buying standards for food and the balanced scorecard at the mo happening at the moment that will take a year and we're working very close with them so they sort of set the rules Crown Commercial Services build the framework and our perspective our role in life really as a Southwest Food Hub is just to make sure that we open up the opportunity as widely as possible to shorten supply chains, 
and to buy through small and medium sized companies. And our objective is to, is to get that to, to a level of 50% um, over the next five years. Um, we, we do um, endless lobbying with, with, with MPs and ministers, um, and we've got very uh, sort of good lines of communication for the likes of Neil Parrish and Victoria Prentice. And we both held this up as a very high priority. And as I said earlier, we're just mapping, we're working with the likes of the NFU to try and map out um, the supply and demand, demand balance um, within the region um, that will help to inform how quickly uh, we can embed the future food framework. Um, so as instructed, that's a really brief overview for me. I'm gonna stop sharing. Uh, and then I'm gonna go back to my, my chairing roles for the meeting. Um, but again, invite any questions um, in the chat or outside of the meeting um, and uh, we'll keep elaborating on our progress uh, during these updates. So we're back on time um, and it gives me great pleasure now to, to um, in introduce Cindy Nutterson um, and Alan Gary from Social Value Portal. Um, and I'm not going to say any more about social value really, other than the fact that it's one of a number of areas that can be positively affected through public sector procurement. And what we're trying to encourage is that public sector buyers look beyond price. Social value is a key part along with climate change and economic benefits um, where, um, where public sector procurement can make a difference. So without further ado, I'm going to hand across to Cindy and Alan. You're very welcome. Thanks, Greg. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Nadearson. I am the Strategic Account Manager for the Public Sector at the Social Value Portal. And Alan, do you want to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Alan Gary, and I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for the Social Value Portal. Fantastic. Thanks very much. So uh, we've been invited here today to give you um, a whistle-stop tour of the Social Value Portal. Um, as well as an overview of social value and how we've been working with both the public and private sector over the last couple of years um, to drive the implementation of this act. Um, before we kick off, there are a few polls uh, that we'd like you to participate in. Um, so we've got three questions. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Um, do you know how much or, or, or do you know much about the Social Value Act? and PPN 0620, which was the policy note published last year by central government on social value. So it would be great if you could let us know um, where you're at with that. Great stuff. Um, the next question. Okay, so wow. All right, that's um, that's good to know. So some of you are um, up to speed. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Ellen. Um, the next question is around the National Tom's Framework. So have you heard about the National Social Value Measurement Framework, which is known as the National Tom's? Um, if you could. Let us know where you're at with that. Okay, great. So I'll make a point of spending a bit of time on that in today's presentation. And finally, I think we've got one more poll Question, have you used the National TOMS measurement framework? So I know a, a small number of you have heard about it, um, but if you have heard about it, have you actually used it? Okay, great. So we, we do have some people um, here today who have. So that's that's great news. Okay, thanks a million, um, Ellen. So let me kick off by sharing these slides. Um, so a little bit about who we are at the Social Value Portal. We are the market leader in social value measurement and reporting. So within the measurement context, um, we have worked collaboratively with the National Social Value Task Force to develop a methodology that can be used to measure social value, which is called 
the National TOMS, and that stands for Themes, Outcomes and Measures. Within a procurement perspective, we work um, extensively with the public sector to support them um, around how to include social value within the tender process, as well as providing a procurement platform so that there is an open, fair and transparent process in place for bidders to submit their social value bids. Contract management um, is something that is an area um, which can be really, really difficult um, to um, manage within the public sector and specifically around social value because it is about the additionality of, of over and above the core contract requirements. So we provide a contract management solution where suppliers or successful suppliers can report on the social value delivery aspect during the contract term. And then finally, um, we also provide a reporting functionality where we as the social value portal, quality assure the data that providers um, input during the contract delivery stage and ensure that actually they meet the evidence requirements um, according to the national TOMS, which means that the public sector has that level of assurance that the commitments made around social value are actually being delivered and those benefits are being realized by communities. We've also mapped the TOMS against the global goals for sustainable development. And over the last year or so, that's been a huge driver in terms of the private sector organizations signing up as members to the portal. This just gives you an idea of some of the organizations we work with in the public sector. We have over 65 clients um, and increasingly we are working with the private sector, um, A, because they are now seeing a huge increase in terms of social value being included as um, a decision-making criteria when awarding public sector contracts, but also there is a realization that um, the private sector needs to look at how they operate their supply chains as well, and the impact that they're having um, on communities. So very quickly, just to give you an idea of some of the figures, because I know stats are always um, something people ask for, Earlier this year, we did a review of the projects that we currently have under management on the portal. That equated to 22.7 billion pounds worth of spend. And that's predominantly um, pri uh, public sector. As a result of those projects, we managed to um, support both the public contracting authority and their supply chains deliver 8.746 thousand jobs for people that are from disadvantaged backgrounds as a result of their social value contribution, over 233,000 volunteering hours, and 3.7 billion pounds of local economic value. And the reason this 3.7 billion pounds is really important is because we absolutely support the aspect around um, supply chains being local, spend being local, so especially with the large contracts that are being tendered, if a large provider commits to spending um, or contracting part of that delivery to local, small, um, micro and medium enterprises, then that actually contributes as part of their social value. On average, what we do see is that um, overall, we are seeing about an additional 20% um, of a social value being delivered. And that again is in addition to the core contract requirements. So David covered um, the um, introduction to the Social Value Act, but it's worth mentioning that outside public services, Social Value Act relates to England um, um, only. Well, it covers England and Wales, but what, what's happened in Wales is that that's been uh, put within the context of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. And in Scotland, it's known as the Procurement Reform Act. 
Now, essentially, all of these acts are trying to do the same thing and promote the same aspect. PPN 0620 is something that was released last year by government. Now, David mentioned earlier that the act did come out, came into effect in 2013 on the 1st of January, but the implementation of that act has been really, really slow. So with PPN 0620, what government have done is rather than alter the legislation, which requires the consideration of the additional benefits, PPN 0620 now states that government organizations, so central government um, departments must now take into account social value benefits when they are um, tendering contracts. And the minimum um, recommended weighting for this in terms of social value contributing to the contract award is 10%. So that came into effect on the 1st of January this year. And what we're gonna see in terms of central government is a larger focus on social value and definitely being taken into account when tendering contracts. So the definition again from the public sector procurement context is that there is absolutely inherent social value that organizations can deliver, but within the procurement context, it is looking at that additionality. So if X is the core contract requirements, then Y is the social value? What is over and above that delivery? This gives you an indication within a local government perspective who have really been at the forefront of including social value um, within contracts. And that ranges not just within services, it's goods and works. Um, I mean, I was surprised uh, a few weeks ago, we had a tender launched by Leeds City Council for sandwiches. And even though um, it was lotted, low value, social value was still included as 10% of that um, tender. So definitely relevant for the food industry as well. Um, weightings are increasing. So when it first started or when, when organizations first started using social value and including it in the um, uh, procurement process, they started off at 5%. PPN 0620 is now positioned that as 10% but we are definitely seeing an increase up to as much as 30% for certain contracts. Benefits, like I said in the slide before, we are seeing evidence of that, and this is definitely driving an increased focus within the public sector to include it within tender exercises. So I do wanna very quickly run through the TOMS framework um, because, we, we've seen that not many people have heard or used it. So the TOMS framework is built on the principles around how do we actually account for social value? Now, we do know that within society, every opportunity offered to every individual has a value. But what the TOMS framework looks at specifically is how do we use social value to address historical social inequalities as part of this process. So for example, if a job was offered to a young person who came from a stable family background, had a good education, no criminal record, et cetera, that job would have an economic value because there would be uh, contributions to society. But from a social value perspective, there wouldn't be um, that additionality. However, if that same job was targeted at a young person that came from a troubled family, left school, um, already has a petty criminal record, and because of the environment that they're in, that is likely to get worse. From that perspective, there is an additionality for social value if that job opportunity is targeted at that young person. So we look at not just the economic contributions, but also the stuff that sits behind that. So savings, impact on the health service, education system, criminal justice system, et cetera. And that is how we develop financial proxies using data from the government Green Book, the Office for National Statistics, as well as research published by various industry bodies. The TOMS framework is based on a series of themes, outcomes, and measures. 
So for example, we look at um, growth and this is where it might be relevant for you as an industry. So Greg mentioned shortening supply chains. Well, absolutely looking at more opportunities for local businesses, SMEs, even BCSEs is considered a social value. And within each of those areas, we have measures that can, um, so spending with local supply chains, and then we allocate values to that. These are just some of the benefits that the TOMS framework provides both for contracting authorities and for tenderers. The National Social Value Task Force um, is the authority or body that is made up of representatives from the public and private sector. It is a collaborative network that looks at the framework and continuously promotes the updating of that as well as the take up of social value around sectors. Um, I have included some social value resources here that are free for you to access. So um, if you're from the private sector, the Social Value uh, Maturity Index Toolkit will help you baseline where you are in relation to social value and also help you identify how you can improve in order to compete effectively. And we have one for the public sector as well. We've got some case studies that you can access. And here are a list of some free resources. So if you are interested in learning more about the National TOMS, there's a tutorial online. There's some easy guides to help you if you're bidding for public sector contracts. And we've also provided you access to the recorded sessions from this year's National Social Value Conference. Appreciate that was quite a quick run through. Um, but we have included our details. So Alan is the business development executive um, who works in the South. So please reach out to him if you wanna know more about the TOMS and the framework um, and my details are here as well. Thanks very much, guys. Done brilliantly well, Cindy, in such a short amount of time. We love challenging speakers to sort of squeeze it all in. And to be honest with you, we could talk all afternoon and still not get tired of listening about social value because it is so important. It's gonna be such a, Part, important part of future public procurement. Um, so um, yeah, thank you for squeezing that in today. We're happy to segue and link um, uh, people to Cindy and the team. And also we will make sure there's sufficient content about social value on the, on the Southwest Food Hub online and also at future events as well. So thank you very, very much. But without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Bethan from the NFU who shares um, the enthusiasm um, and, and the relentless uh, 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 intention to open up public sector procurement. So over to you, over to you, Bethan. Thank you very much, um, Greg, for the introduction. Um, I'll crack on as a uh, time permitting. So uh, I'm Bethan Williams. I'm the Food Service and Public Procurement Advisor in the NFU, and I sit in the HQ team, so the headquarters team um, in the National um, Food Chain Unit. Um, I work very closely with Alex Stevens and Mel Squires in the Southwest. Um, so, but I'm de absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, I'm just going to touch on quickly in my presentation the work of the NFU and what our key asks are, um, and kind of what are our aims and ambitions around um, public sector procurement. So, um, quickly, just regards to um, the team and our role. So, like I said, I sit in the National Food Chain team, um, and we cover every single part of the supply chain. So. I do food service and I cover public sector, but my four colleagues will cover all the retailers, food labeling, organics, grocery code adjudicator, branded companies, and farm assurance and uh, standards, particularly Red Tractor. So um, we cover everything from post farm gate. Um, and um, for us in particular with public procurement, it's an area that we've worked in for a long time but it's a real um, priority for both our office holders. So Manette Butters, that you'll know our president, Stuart Roberts, our deputy president, and Tom Bradshaw, our vice president, um, but also all, all the areas of our business. So quickly, um, why, why uh, I do my role, what conversations we've been having. Well, first of all, it's a market with a huge amount of value and it's a market that our food, uh, our food producers and our NFU members really want to understand more and really want to supply. I mean, when I talk about um, public sector procurement, I think back to COVID last year when we were inundated with members wanting to 
uh, build up relationships with local supply chains, you know, uh, say, how can we help out the NHS? How can we help, how can we help schools, the education system? It's something that for us at the very heart of our supply chains and our food sector. Um, we also think it's in a great public and producer's interest that we uh, that the market utilises our world leading food and farming industry. Uh, we have a very high standards um, uh, and we're really proud of that. And we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to eat our food. We also um, believe that we can deliver safe, traceable, affordable, nutritious food to all markets. And this is something that we um, really want to build more relationships with the public sector because actually there's a really good story to tell and really and really many opportunities for British food producers. Um, and also you know, building on the back of social value, for us it's a real opportunity for contracting authorities, local authorities, you know, government to invest their public funds in uh, the economy, the environment and the communities that produce food and the value that not, it's not just the, the food the food served on that plate, it's the wider values in which procuring from the British agri-food supply chain can deliver. So what's our role within public sector procurement? Um, nice photo of our office holders there. Our first and foremost is to promote the utilisation of British food and communicate food and farming messages. You know, the NFU has done has made some really big commitments in, in recent years. Firstly, our net zero commitment, so we're committed to net zero by 2040. But there's many other um, food and farm messages that we want to talk to the market about, we want to talk to the supply chain about, and we feel that there's many opportunities for collaboration and celebration. Um, and we also um, want to address current supply chain barriers um, by calling for more transparent procurement structures. So we know that there may be uh, procurement by um, procurement leads or buyers or contracting authorities that really would like to buy British food, but there's challenges in that there's that there are current challenges, and we also know that there's food producers that really want to access these markets, that really want to build relationships with you know local um, supply chains, but current. So we we you know we really want to understand how we can work with government, how we can work with regional government, and how we can work with. The likes you know of, of Greg who we have a brilliant and um, um, relationship with um, to help alleviate some of these barriers and get this great quality food into these markets. So um, I've just done some headings here for NFU policy asks but I just want to talk through a couple of things that we that we do and um, uh, what we're trying to achieve. First of all um, the market must uphold our, our British food standards. Um, last year one million people signed our um, petition to protect our food standards. Um, we're pleased that we've made steps forward to the Trade and Agricultural Commission, but we have very high standards in the in, in the UK and we've got to be um, um, where we have conversations about making sure that our food standards, our agricultural standards are upheld in, in, in all markets. And um, we, we look forward to responding to the government buying standards consultation this summer um, about how we can uh, utilize our, our, our food there. Um, second of all, um, we are working to both champion our food, but also to understand how contracting authorities can buy and purchase more British food and drink. Um, we know, like we said, that there, there's a split often with the will and sometimes the barriers, and, and, and we want to make sure that we both incentivize and collaborate and, and get that will there to, to work with local suppliers, work with you know seasonal food, work with British farmers, but also to make sure that those barriers are um, are reduced so we can supply that market as efficiently as possible. Um, the third one is the utilization of the balanced scorecard. Um, the 2014 Peter Bonfield report and the um, uh, subsequent balanced scorecard is a fantastic tool that looks at procurement um, against wider values other than price. I know that you'll all be very, uh, well aware of it. Um, we would like to see that more embedded into contracts. You know, it looks at not just the price but other values. And for us, if we look at British food and farming, if we look at the food that we produce, but how we produce it, we really meet those standards. So we really want to work with government in how we can utilise that scorecard more and how we can get that into contracts um, and I think that you know from all the stakeholders that I speak to this is something that everybody wants to work um, uh, to achieve. Um, like I said we um, touched on the government buying standards um, and we've got a consultation this summer but for us the government buying standards must drive best practice. 
It must place um, domestic food production at the heart of sourcing policies. It must um, be uh, ambitious in, in wanting to achieve um, great quality food to this market. Um, and we really look forward to, res to responding to this consultation. We think that British Food and Drink has a really valued part of it. We can feel that we can have a more valued part of public sector supply chains. So we um yeah, so we'll be responding in the summer. And the other point, and I think this is where we work really closely with Greg and the South West Food Hub, is that we um want to increase support and, and, and market opportunities for SME businesses. We know government has the one in three pounds commitment and SME sourcing, and we um we really want to maximize that. So if we look at a lot of our food producers, um they are they're, they're naturally SME businesses. And it's looking at both how do we get that supply chain and tendering process to open up um, more opportunities, whether it's in smaller lots or whether it's different contracting terms to help SME businesses. But it's also to incentivize that. How do we communicate to contracting authorities the opportunities when you go to local SME businesses and go to regional food suppliers? And then finally, I can't, uh, you know, I can't put on that that as supporting the dynamic food framework as this on the National Advisory Board. Alex brilliantly works with you in the Southwest, and I am I'm very, very, very grateful for Alex as well. Um, but we're really supportive of this, of, of this piece of work. We're really supportive of making sure that our farmers, our food producers have the most amount of access and how we can increase communication, increase collaboration, and therefore essentially get great quality food on the plates of schools, hospitals, a defense, justice system, you know, we think that in, in the years to come, there are plenty of opportunities there. And finally, there's quite a lot of plate spinning in public procurement right now. Um, so um, I really um, would like to, to say that I've covered this quite quickly, but I'm always here for a conversation. Please get in touch if you have any questions. If you want to talk to the NFU, you've both got Alex and I, and we'll be delighted to have a conversation and see how we can champion British food and drink and our, and our members. So um, hopefully I've stepped to time. Um, but um, I'll pass you back over to Brad. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. That's great. And yeah, again, we'll act as a conduit to, to keep you in touch with the NFU. But I think what, what I'm hoping comes out through this and, and all of our events is that we are really bringing together, all of us are working hard to bring together many of the forces that can make these changes in public sector procurement that we all aspire to. Um, so it's, it's, it feels like a collective effort, you know, just in, just in today's event, uh, with Food and Farming Countryside Commission, with David, um, with Social Value, uh, with, with Cindy and Alan, uh, and now with Bethan, you know, we are working together to make sure we make the most of this once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, but without further ado, because we need to move on, we want to try and keep to time. I'm going to pass on to, uh, to, to Lee to give you an overview of Partners and, and just to, to un underpin the fact that um, partners under one of uh, a number of partners we have supporting the Southwest Food Hub, not only from a financial perspective, but also providing insight and support for small and, and medium sized businesses across the region. So, Lee, over to you. Greg, thank you very much and thanks for the invite and the, uh, the, the warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we're delighted to be sponsors of the, the Southwest Food Hub. It plays to us actually in a lot of ways. We love the innovation uh, that's being demonstrated on these calls. The new approach to public service food procurement is, is great and that ability to change, uh, change the sector that you're in. We love that. We think it's a fantastic initiative and we're, we're proud to be sponsors of it. Um, Utilising tech for better client outcomes is something that I'm going to focus on in my presentation. So I've got 10 minutes. I'm, I'm stuck for time. My name's Lee David. I'm the managing partner of uh, Partners And. We're a risk protection advisory business, uh, and I'm proud to live in Devon. I'm a southwest guy through and through. I don't sound like it unless I pop to the pub, Greg, which would be about one o'clock, uh, and then I switch to full Devonian mode. But that aside, I'm delighted to be with you for 10 minutes. I'm going to whistle stop you through... Uh, First five minutes, who, who are partners and? Have you forgotten something with the name? What, you know, what, what's going on with this, uh, with who you are? So if you, let me uh, move the slide on. So our names are identity. It's pretty simple, it's balanced, and it's easy to read. Partners take centre stage because it's the very bedrock of which this business is built upon. Bed, a partnership with our clients, partnerships with our colleagues, and partnerships with people in our ecosystem. Uh, the Ampisan provides the talking point, actually. It's uh, in your face, it's green, uh, with a red dot next to it. But it's all about collaboration. Uh, we're not about commoditizing the advice process. 
We are completely about uh, understanding your businesses uh, and in an advisory way, giving you the best risk protection advice. So it, uh, it talks about collaboration. We provide more than just insurance. We're, we're in partnership with you for the long haul. Uh, I want to know about your business today, tomorrow, in five years' time. I would be asking you for your business plan because, goodness forbid, in the event of a serious claim, a loss adjuster would do. So hold that thought because uh, Partners and has been born because we believe uh, there's a better way of doing things in the market. And the full stop emphasizes our no-nonsense approach. So uh, a desire for change. We, we believe, I've been in the industry for 32 years. I have to pinch myself uh, when I say that. So uh, I joined Man and Boy at 16 uh, and I've worked in the industry and, and progressed to, to uh, high echelons within big corporates. Uh, and what I found in that was scale, globalization and commoditization became the norm. Uh, and I joined, uh, I actually joined an insurance office when I was 16 to try and do some good. Uh, and I felt that there were too many adver adversarial relations with insurers and clients. And I thought there needs to be a different way. So uh, I want to build a business that's built on the best traditions of client service. Uh, and like the Southwest Food Hub, uh, bring to life state of the art technology to drive better insights for clients, better outcomes for them and better risk presentation to the insurance market, which means uh, our clients, should they need them, have their claims paid. Uh, we believe in making a difference for our clients and our colleagues, uh, and we're absolutely a firm believer in truism. So uh, we believe that motivated, competent people deliver wonderful client service. And I'm very proud to lead uh, 51 people here in the southwest from Bristol down to Newquay. Uh, our story is unique. Uh, I know you're still shocked that I, you can't believe I've been in the insurance industry 32 years. But that aside, um, there is a burning desire for me to challenge what I believe are misguided market practices. Uh, McTavish, uh, a very uh, well-recognized uh, business in our sector, said that 60% of claims over £2 million end up in litigation. How is that right for clients? So there is a different way. With our, our pillars on the bedrock of, uh, of partnership uh, spell out pace. We're progressive, we're approachable, we're collaborative and we're enabling. More on that in just a moment because I'm conscious of time. Our specialisms are there on the screen. Second row down really on the far right would be food and drink. Uh, we know these sectors inside out. We've got industry specialists that work in these sectors. So uh, by having that real sense and uh, feel and smell of those industries, uh, we believe with you, we can understand them uh, better, therefore present the risk to the insurer in a better way. So our vision uh, without wishing to sound arrogant is not to be the biggest but to certainly be the best advisory business in the UK. That is our fundamental goal. Uh, and how do you do that, Lee? How do you stand out from the crowd in terms of being the best advisory business? It sounds very grand. Well, I'm gonna give you uh, a few things that I think uh, stand us out from the crowd. Firstly, our values and people, then our broad proposition, the advice methodology that we use, risk identification, and finally a claims promise. So the art of modern technology. As I've said, in a market that I believe is characterised by short-termism, diminishing client service, our values, our purpose, and the team that we've picked set us apart. We're unique in being able to offer a broad proposition for your business, your employees, your home, and your family. And our advice methodology, point three, is something I'm very proud of. Uh, a lot of uh, insurance brokers, per se, turn up and ask to see your last schedule and try and replicate the risk. They don't talk about the, your direction of travel. They don't talk about emerging risks. They don't talk about where you wish to end up in in five years time and how they might help and make sure the programme protects you along that journey. So every year we, uh, we talk to you, we go back to first principles. We focus on current risk and future risk with you, not just about what has been. Uh, we've got a set of tools. I'm going to touch on a couple of those later because I believe in, in the food and drink sector. These are a couple of tools that can really bring things alive. Uh, and, and finally, our claims promise. Um, where insurers tend to appoint their own loss adjusters on large claims, uh, we've gone the other way, actually. We appoint uh, a loss adjuster on behalf of our clients. It is absolutely unique in the UK marketplace. So for any material damage or business interruption claim over £25,000, we have a chartered loss adjuster sat next to our clients to make sure that that claim is absolutely presented the right way and paid the right way. So there are no surprises. So on big claims, they don't end up in litigation at court, which absolutely def 
smashes our industry's reputation, frankly. There is a better way. This is, is I believe, what makes us different. I won't bore you with the acronym, it's there, uh, it'll be up, up on the deck, I'm conscious of time, but there are some of the uh, attributes our team, uh, that our team runs to. It's woven into our DNA, we run to that on our objectives, uh, and uh, we do run at pace too. I've never had a busier diary, Greg, um, to be honest, that's life. So finally on Partners and I'm conscious of time, is we're not transactional. If you take one thing away from uh, my presentation today, we're not transactional. We're here for the long haul, we're here to protect your business holistically. We are founded on partnership. We're so brave we put it in our name. And we intend and aim to engage with you more than just once a year. We don't want to turn up just with a bill. We want to understand your business fully and the ebbs and flows of that. Uh, and we believe that if we deliver that, we'll be different to any other broker that you've ever dealt with. So welcome to Partners And uh, as I move off into a few more relevant food and drink issues. So the UK insurance market, I don't know if you know this, if your advisors are talking to you about this at the moment, but the UK insurance market is traditionally cyclier. There we call it a soft or hard market. Uh, and right now we're in a position of a, of a hard market. And uh, so what that means is uh, traditionally in a soft market, it's low premiums, plenty of choice for, for clients and a real buyer's market in terms of limits of indemnity and, and covers that are available. That is completely uh, inverted now and we're a, in, in something called a hard market. Uh, there are rising premiums uh, driven by BI claims from COVID. Uh, contrary to popular belief, the UK insurance industry will uh, are on for about 7 billion of, uh, of costs. Uh, storm and flood damage in 2020 and legislation change around personal injury claims has, has made uh, premiums start to rise. As a result of a hardening market, it means excesses might jump, they might double, they might triple. So you need to be having the right advice around that. And also, uh, where you might have had typically higher levels of indemnity, PL cover uh, for a certain amount, that might be halved, it may be pulled back, they may walk away from it completely. So it's really important at this time that you have a risk protection advisor look at things for you. And the liability uh, issue on higher, high indemnity risks uh, have been driven because of such terrible events like Grenfell. So uh, more restrictions on policies, less competition due to fewer insurers, and the food and drink industry are uh, feeling the pinch in, in a hardening market. Just Allianz, uh, you'll recognise them as a big UK player, a big worldwide player actually, have reduced capacity in the food and drink sector terribly. So uh, if your broker's not talking to you about that at the moment, please talk to us because certainly from a risk protection point of view, how we mitigate that risk and present that risk will help you get a better uh, programme for your business. Secondly, uh, and is about wellness, and engagement. So COVID has been terrible for us uh, all. Uh, I've never done more screen calls, uh, as I'm sure you all have. Normally I've got the dog barking, which keeps it interesting as well, but today she's been very good. But all, all joking aside, uh, we sometimes overlook, we look at our fleets, we look at our buildings, we look at our, our product that we're producing, but we don't look at our people. Uh, and at the very heart of every business, large or small, is your people. How are you looking after those guys in this terrible time? Uh, these human factors can harm your business and holistically we look at those. We look at things around business protection. I won't bore you with those slides, they'll be on there, that they'll be on the deck. So goodness forbid if there's four shareholders and somebody is ill and, and doesn't, you know, and passes away, what happens to that business? It's a question that's rhetorical. Uh, are there articles of association in place? I'll let that rhetorically hang. Because if not, the wife may not want to sell it or what things may go on, things are different. That's often overlooked. People look at the, the factory or the fleet or the liabilities. They don't look at the people and we're, we're different there. And in this time of wellness being at the top of the agenda, with these stats, as you can see, uh, I won't bore you with those, but 64% of people feel significantly increased in anxiety and depression as a result of the pandemic. That is a negative impact on your business and we can help mitigate those risks. We can't, however, sadly stop a pandemic. And finally, uh, for me, as I whistle stop through, is uh, with uh, the pandemic, we saw a massive shift to online distribution for food and drink pro providers. Huge. Uh, some have done particularly well, and I'm delighted for, for those guys. Uh, but what is the risk to their business? Do they understand it? Is cyber just something that happens to Manchester United or, uh, you know, they're just the people that get hacked? 
No, they're not. I was with a client two weeks ago uh, where they tried to extort uh, him with ransomware for £150,000 of Bitcoin. So it's topical and it's live. What I'd like to offer everybody connected to the Southwest Food Hub is, uh, is something uh, gratis, really. We will, uh, using some proprietary software, probe your IT system externally as if we were a hacker. And then we can come and show you those exposures so you can give those to your IT teams or to your, your outsourced IT provider. Here are some stats. Uh, Cindy made the point earlier, no slide would be complete without stats. So I'm delighted not to disappoint her. 64% of companies had at least, uh, different, yeah, I won't bore you with them, but they're there on the screen, I'm conscious of time. But ransomware is real and it's happening to businesses locally to us. And if you've got a cyber connection you're dealing online, here's a stat I'd like to leave you with. You're more likely to, you're nine times more likely to have a business finishing cyber attack than you are to have any other risk finish your business. Nine times more likely. So uh, we're, we're more than happy. Reach out to me at the end of the presentation. Uh, I will be able to give you this beautiful report. It's a dummy one on the screen now. But that, what that will do is highlight those exposures for your business. Uh, I wouldn't want anybody to fall foul of uh, somebody Bitcoin mining. So uh, now hopefully that's the time. I shall put my details up at the end of that. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening and uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Lee. Really insightful. And again, all the details will go onto the online uh, Southwest Food Hub online hub. Um, I'm just mindful of the time. So questions in the, in the hub we'll respond to. I'm just going to quickly finally share um, our contact details and remind everyone that our next event is on the 12th of May. Um, and at that event, we're hoping to have Phil Shelley from NHS uh, talking about their food strategy, hoping to have Neil Parrish back talking about what happened in the EFRA review and also to get the involvement of CCS again into these events. Um, as I think we, we started off with a title that was it's time for change at the beginning of these events. And I think we ought to move on to be accelerating change in our next event. So um, thanks very much to everyone for their time. Thanks for all of the speakers. It's been fascinating. And for all of your hard work and the input. Thanks very much to Chrissy and Ellen in the background who've pulled it all together. And thanks for all of your time.